At what point did you say to yourself, I'm actually setting out to build a personal computer? Well, about age 10, <laughs> I, I, I somehow fell in love with this concept of computers when you could never see one in a school in your life. You never thought there'd be a job in computers. But I fell in love with it, and I knew eventually that I would have one. And then I started teaching myself how to design one. Don't ask me how, not one book. I didn't read one book. I just looked at parts that were available. It's like if you were, um, you, you knew how to use a saw, maybe, and you had pieces of wood, or you knew what kind of pieces of wood you could, you could buy, and you have an architecture, an idea in your head of a building you want to make, you could figure out how the, where they all go. So I started just learning to, to design computers. I knew I was very advanced. Did you ever I imagine that? Um, that even when we started a company like Apple, how could you ever imagine something like a modern cell phone, mm. um, a modern smartphone, um, displays that they have, um, the, the fact that we couldn't imagine that you could ever have enough memory to hold a song. A song. So to be honest, we started this company okay. with, we were state of the art, out there stretching, doing things nobody had ever thought of, nobody ever imagined. You'd have color in a computer, graphics, game, games inside of a computer. I mean, it was just a whole new world, and yet, we couldn't even imagine you'd ever have a song or a video or a photograph on a screen. Do you, you know? know, can you remember what it was that allowed you to put two and two together and decide, that's what I want to invent. I want to invent the oh, yeah. computer. Where, where did that inspiration come from? It came from a number of sources because all my life I wanted my own computer. I even told my dad at a certain point, I'm going to have a computer someday. And he said, it costs as much as a house. And I said, well, I'll live in an apartment. I'm going to have a computer someday in my life. And I, and I had a very, very good job designing calculators for Hewlett Packard as an engineer. But I would use their computer. It was still, the computer was expensive and big, and all us engineers shared it. We would take turns on the computer that Hewlett Packard had. I wanted my own computer, and finally, in a little club where people were talking about these microprocessors and how computers were going to be affordable someday, how they were going to give us a better world, where the little guy who knew how to program was going to be more important than his CEO and his company because the programmer could bring in his own computer, type in the company's financial data, and spew out the results. And he could control the lights in his house, and he could send a message, and 100 people could read it you know, an hour later even, or minutes later. And these were like exciting social dimensions. Kids were now going to be able to learn something and type in an answer and get told if it's right or wrong. And all of a sudden, their brains were going to be so much more powerful than any brains ever before. I was scared. But these, these little social goals are what made me say, I have the technical skills. I understand all these parts that are affordable. At this point in history, 1975, the parts to make a computer that a person can afford, that they can type a program, be it a game, be it a Hewlett Packard logic simulation, they could type it in and run it and get the answers, was here. Hmm. And, and once I saw it, I, I knew exactly how I was going to get from where I was at the time. I took a lot of little steps that were closer and closer and closer to what became these computers. I mean, I already had a, built a machine on my own. I just wanted it. I heard about this thing called the ARPANET. ARPANET. ARPANET was the, the forerunner of today's internet. Mm -hmm. It was started by the DARPA agency to connect a bunch of universities together. At first, there were only about a dozen of them, you know, in the United States mainly. And I discovered that you could get on, and I built a machine. You could type on it type to a computer way out across the country in Boston. And then the Boston computer could type way back to my TV set because I designed little circuits that turned on at the exact right times little bits of electricity that caused white dots on my TV. And they would spell out letters. So I could already type to a computer far away. It was only a small task of now making my little computer, which is like one chip and some memory, right there where I was typing. Do you remember, as David McFadden described it, the eureka moment where you said to yourself, what I have just invented will change the world? A few of those. I mean, one eureka moment was the night that I attended this club and took home a data sheet for a microprocessor and discovered these microprocessors are just like the computers I used to design back in high school that I could never build. I could never afford the parts. I said, I now know I can, the whole formula to building a, an affordable computer with no money. For, of, for me. And that was one eureka moment. Another was, I came up with a very strange idea one night when Steve Jobs and I worked four nights in a row, days and nights, no sleep. Your mind drifts into a very creative space. And something signified color to me on something I saw on the Atari floor. And all of a sudden, an idea popped in my head of a way to use a $1 chip to produce color. 
And up till then, you'd think color technology and American televisions was $1,000 and all these little parts and special, very difficult electronics, a type that I didn't even know. And I had this little trick that might work or it might not. The day that I finally built it, finally, you know, just trying to add color to one computer, and then I condensed it down and down and down, came up with a tiny little design, and I could type numbers into a, the computer, and it would pop up squares on my TV, blue, yellow, pink. I showed it to Steve Jobs. That time, we knew that this product was going to be so big a step for the world that we weren't going to give it away. Huh. Like the Apple One, I had given it away for free. Nobody owns it. No copyright notices, no nothing. I gave it away at the computer club before Steve Jobs ever said, let's start a company. <laughs> but this one, we weren't going to give away free. That was the Apple II. I'm always fascinated in the distinction between nurture versus nature. Do you have any idea how much of what you were able to achieve was because you got the kind of education that steered you in that direction versus how much of it was because something just divine touched you? Yes. I, since you can never really be sure and know what was inside of you, you were born with the talent, you look back, you can't remember everything anyway. You have childhood amnesia up to age 10, um, you know, especially up to age 6. So you can't really say, so you just assume. I assume like everyone else that it was the accidents I ran into that were the guides, the friends, the, the, the lucky things I got in school, the grades I got in certain subjects. Um, those things were partly accidental. But then again, I do know that they do studies with identical twins in different environments. And there are a lot of things that are in our brain, even related to intelligence factors, or the way we call intelligence, the phony way, the number way, um, the IQ, that sort of say that some of it is inborn. And uh, some of it is, is some's are nurture, some's nature. It's hard to say. What is a baby really born with that they can show? They can't present very much. They have a very capable brain. How can you tell one brain's better than another? About all you can say a baby does is right away, sound is on that side, they kind of turn their head that way. Mm -hmm. But would but you say? Not that, I think we're more like white sheets. White sheets. Just, just white sheet of paper, empty blank. And uh, it, mostly it's just from encountering things in life. So let's think about post-secondary education, for example. How much of that either was or was not responsible for what you were able to achieve? Post-secondary? Yeah. I mean, you mean like college? Yeah. Well, you know, I look back and I think of specific college courses. And the first couple of years of college are very general. And then I had a year where, oh, pick your own courses. All I took was graduate courses in hardware and software. And I do some of those. That they, well, all of college helps you knowing that there's a long, long process of a lot of steps of learning, and that helps you with projects you do in engineering in later days, long, long processes to get to the end. You know, you go a whole semester in college and get a grade, and you go a long time in a project before it's done, it works, it's, it's quality. But um, some, of the, some, of the, some of the computer classes I took, later times there are little bits of them that actually came out being used in my work at Apple, but almost nothing that I could really say for sure. I was very, very self-taught, and that's the best way to be taught. It's when you want to learn something, you're going to learn it much better than anything else. I think a teacher's job should be less what they're teaching and more, at least at younger ages. Mm -hmm. I'm talking pre-secondary. Uh, you know, um, it's less what they're teaching, but more that they motivate the students to want to learn. The student wants to learn, gets interested. It's fun or it's just intriguing. This is weird knowledge. I like it. It's like watching a movie, but it's learning stuff. Um, then they're, you, you can't stop them. Gotcha. Where does Apple come from? Apple? Yeah, why Apple? Eve? We're going back to the first Apple? No, I mean the, <laughs> your company. Where, oh. Where'd you pick the name Apple out of? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Um, Steve Jobs, uh, I, I just picked him up at the airport. He came back from Oregon where he, he would spend time, and we're driving along, and he says, I got a great name for our company, Apple Computer. And both of us tried to think of technical names, but Apple was too good a name. My first response was, what about the Beatles, Apple Records? Well, that was and he says, well, that's a record company. We're a computer company. Oh, is that all it takes? He says, yeah. <laughs> she said it confidently, so I bought it. <laughs> and um, Did, did no, you know but, the Beatles were going to sue you years later? Now, I knew that Steve worked in what he called an orchards up in Oregon. Mm -hmm. And I wondered, did they have apple trees? But I'm so shy and silent, I never even asked. I never asked people personal questions. So I never asked all these years. I sort of just hoped that that was part of it. And then one year ago, almost one year ago today, in the finale of Dancing with the Stars, I sat with a doctor 
that treated one of my major injuries, actually. A doctor said that his brother worked with Steve up on that, that orchard or whatever farm in Oregon. And his brother had come up with the name and given it to Steve. You so there was actually more to the story. <laughs> you learn it you, you, 30 years later.